Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Retaining Women in Online Programs. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Director of Programs and Sponsorship here at WCET. As we go through the presentation, if you have any questions, please enter them into the question box. We'll hold on to your questions till the end of the presentation portion, and then we'll get to those. I've dropped into the chat box a link to the PowerPoint presentation if you'd like to follow along. The webinar is being recorded and we'll send you the link to the recording and the PowerPoint and any resources that are shared. And we tend to have a pretty active Twitter back channel, so if you'd like to follow along, the hashtag is WCET webcast. I got a question about sound. Is my sound okay? Okay. All right, as we go through the webcast, we'll do brief introductions with the panelists, and then we'll do an overview about recruitment and retention strategies for, for specifically women in online. We'll have a moderated conversation with our esteemed panelists, and then we'll get to audience Q&A. Again, if you have any questions, enter them into the question box, and we'll hold your questions. If by chance we don't get to all of your questions today, we'll pull those out, share them with the panelists, and get those back out. So today we have an, a wonderful moderator and lead presenter, my great colleague and friend, Dr. Tanya Spillavoy, and Tanya is the Director of Open Policy here at WCET, and she is an OER expert across the land. But Tanya, I'd really like to get to something important today as we have our first semi-cool air weather in uh, Boulder today. So <laughs> it has me thinking about pumpkin spice and whether or not pumpkin spice is something you anticipate or dread? Uh, so in the past, I've been really anti pumpkin spice and really uh, put it off as long as I possibly could because I hate the thought of summer ending. But last week I snuck a pumpkin spice latte and it was so good. <laughs> and I've been, this is like true confessions because I haven't been able to tell anybody till now. So you just outed me on the pumpkin spice sneaking. That's okay. You shared your, your deepest, darkest stories with 104 <laughs> of your closest my, friends. <laughs> my family's not going to let me live that down. Well, great. Well, we have wonderful panelists today, so I'm going to pass it off to you, Tanya, and then you can take us through introductions of the panelists. Well, these are some wonderful panelists that we have today, and the reason why they've been selected to participate in the webinar is that they come at online learning and especially the retention of women in online programs from a number of different angles. So uh, as they'll talk about their own experiences, you'll see that each of these participants has different experiences with um, both being an online student herself or helping other women succeed in online programs. So I'd like to start with Leah and you can introduce yourself, Leah. Hello everyone, my name is Leah Heyman and I am the Dean of Instruction at United Tribes Technical College and I also am the director of our extended learning department that oversees continuing education units, dual credit enrollment, and uh, online education. Great, and Leah, um, we, I forgot to ask you to tell us about your preference for, for dogs or cats. I, well, I do not have a preference because I love each equally. But if you ask me the llama question, I would definitely love a llama more than dogs and cats. <laughs> awesome. And how about Whitney? Uh, hi, I'm Whitney Kilgore. Should I lead with the dog versus cat question? Sure. Or no? <laughs> So we've been a cat family because when you're raising four children, dogs can be a lot to manage on top of that. But we've recently converted to be a dog family as um, three of the four children are out of the house and we just have one at home. I guess uh, I had baby fever, so I got a puppy. Um, so, so we are dog people now. Um, my work or my background, um, I am the uh, co-founder and chief academic officer of iDesign. We help universities build, grow, and support online and blended programs too. And, um, and so we provide white glove concierge support to faculty so that the instructional design piece of it is a little easier for them as they go forward and they can focus on designing student-centered learning with our support. 
Um, prior to that, I worked in the development of programs in the US, Latin America, Spain, the UK, the Philippines, China, and Australia. And um, some folks may remember me from human MOOC. So uh, through my PhD program, I got really focused on the idea of humanizing online teaching and learning. And so I know a lot of my digital colleagues from my work in, in the MOOC space in, in the human MOOC. So good to see everybody today. Thanks, Whitney. And now we'll have Callie talk about um, introduce herself and uh, also whether or not she's a cat person or a dog person. So I'm Callie Morrison and I'm the Associate Dean of Alternative Learning at American Public University System. So we have American Military and American Public University. Um, I am a dog person. I grew up as a cat person. We always had cats. And when I went away to college, I came home for the first time at Thanksgiving and um, my face exploded. Turns out I was allergic to cats. So I have 100, 200 pounds of dogs in my office most days. I kicked them out so you don't have to listen to them snore today. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Callie. Uh, next, we'll go to Patrice. Hi, Patrice Torsivia Prosco. I'm currently the Associate Director Learning Design in the Teaching and Learning Lab at Harvard Graduate School of Education. Prior to that, I was at Cornell University in the Center for Teaching Innovation, where I worked on MOOCs, the Massive Open Online Courses, and helping them start up um, the on, their online course development process. And prior to that, for about 15 years, I was at SUNY Empire State College teaching um, online and blended courses internationally. So I've been in the online space for a long time, and my um, research really is focused around um, persistence of women in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And my dissertation was specifically around women returning to school and fully online programs. Um, I also was a cat person my entire life. I always had cats growing up and even um, illegally had a cat in my dorm when I was an undergraduate, but don't tell anyone. Um, and my children desperately wanted a dog for a long, long time. So when my youngest turned six, we got a dog, a black lab mix named Lucky. And then we have two cats, Snowball and Oliver. And um, prior to this, I was showing pictures of how well they all get along. They kind of pile on top of each other and sleep together. And so, yes, um, I'm, I guess equal. <laughs> That's fantastic. So joining us during the webinar today is Candy, my new little puppy. Actually, it's my daughter's, but she's pretty nappy right now. So I'll put her back in her little bed. So let's talk about the topic of women in online programs. And first, it's really important to understand the ecosphere of, of gender in general in uh, colleges. So in the 1970s, men were the primary uh, college student, but now it's gotten a lot different. So demographically, um, in 2019, according to the National Center for Educational Statistics, 56% uh, of all college students are women. And uh, this is probably a rough estimate that the Department of Ed estimates that 57% of college students will be women by two, 2026. So how do you, how does this go? Um, you can change that slide. So if we look at by modality, um, this is a really great study done by uh, WCET and Babson Survey Research Group and other partners. It's called the Digital Learning Compass. Mm -hmm. And you can see that nationally, 30% of all students in higher education now are taking at least one distance ed course. So it's broken out into students who are exclusively distance and those who are taking some courses. How about gender? So this gets, this breaks it down just a little bit more toward our topic. And so we're looking at online students by gender. If you look at the small print here, this only is a survey of community colleges, however, and this is from the ITC Council. Um, and their most recent uh, study shows that with, if you look at gender and age in 2019, 62% are female and 38% are male. And if you look across at the age response, you'll also see that most are in 
um, you know, an, an adult category. So somewhere around uh, 25 years of age or any of another 57% who are, um, who are of like traditional college age. So why did this happen? Um, well, when I first started uh, being at college, um, professor and started looking at online college, these are the images that I saw advertised. And everybody looked really, really happy. Um, everyone has their hair done. Their house is very clean. And it looks like the kids are really enjoying having a mother who's also an online student. <laughs> so I, I mean, this was like a very utopic viewpoint that we presented to both to the public and that women saw um, in the media and for marketing. So um, I, I was a, de I was a uh, teacher at United Tribes Technical College and this is where I met Leah Heyman who's one of our panelists and um, one of the unique things about United Tribes Technical College is that many of the students were parents and the majority of those students were female who were in my classes. And United Tribes itself has this wonderful campus community where they have um, campus housing for families, an elementary school, a daycare on campus. Um, my mom works at the elementary school. And um, so it's part of the culture and the community that children are just um, everyday seen in, in all the buildings and on the campus. And um, families were part of the academic culture. And there were many times when um, if a child was sick or couldn't get to daycare, that I allowed mothers to bring their baby to class if they needed. So this started my idea of how do we better support mothers both on campus and online. Um, and I began working at a, a for-profit college where around 80% of the students took at least one online course. And then I really got to know the reality of how difficult it is for women to be successful in online courses. Um, retention and completion numbers were always lower for online students than they were for on-campus students. Um, and that was mostly because students had other responsibilities. They were working, they were parenting, they had issues that as the dean, I couldn't really help them with. I mean, I could help them academically, but I couldn't solve their daycare issues, right? Um, and then I was the, the director of distance education and in the academic team for the whole university system and all distance ed. And even there, um, we would always talk about how to work better with populations that were online, um, and this, this got a lot of interest for me in how, what are the best ways to help women and what are the characteristics um, to help student mothers re retain in online programs. So that was my dissertation topic. So I, when I uh, surveyed or when I interviewed my participants, I, I interviewed 12 participants in my study and I found that the reason that they chose online education is because they were busy and they did have a busy schedule and they wanted more time with their kids. So those advertisements that you saw of the working mom and she's got the kid in front of her at the computer, that is why women chose online um, programs, all of them, because they felt like they wouldn't have time to go to class at night and leave their family. So this is a drawing done by my son. He's nine. Uh, his, at the time, I asked him to draw what it was like having a mom who was in college, and that's Dakota next to me. And as you can see, the room is not clean because my house never was. There was just like, it looked like chaos. Um, it was never the idealistic video you know the photo of the mom in the online class and I think the funny thing <laughs> about this photo is that he drew my husband or the dad in the background he's just like watching tv or something like that but both the kids are still around mommy so I've got like my baby girl over here playing with toys and he's busy and that's really what it looked like was that um 
at the end of the day, the kids still wanted to hang out with me. And there's a researcher named Kramer. Uh, she did a study and she coined the term, the third shift. Uh, and this is the definition of the time when mothers are working on their coursework. They're working either early, early in the morning, before their day begins, or they stay up super late after everybody's in bed and try to study, which we know is probably sleep de deprivation and really difficult. So um, a lot of the active academic work happens late at night or early in the morning and it's extra, extra work for the moms. So that's actually a picture of my daughter. That's Ruby. She's about 10 months old in that photo. Um, you can just see the plea of wanting attention on her face. And we, we see that women in online programs, and especially those who are doing caretaking, are struggling um, to, to take care of everything. So they've got um, working, they've got parenting. However, they have women had um, a strong motivation to complete their degrees. And I think it's because they need it, right? They need it bad because we're paid less in the workplace. Um, we know that we have to have those degrees to have the opportunities. And um, that, that desire to complete something is what makes women more motivated to persist and complete their online degree programs. So what are the essential um, characteristics of the, of the women who succeed and complete um, their, their programs? And what I found was that women used small achievements to lead to bigger achievements. So I coined this phrase, small wins, and I use it a lot in my OER work and on, on Twitter. Because I think people think that they have to do something outstanding, um, you know, like a degree program is huge, but along the way, there's just so many milestones and small wins, like completing that assignment or showing up for class or passing with this, a B, right? Sometimes it's just small wins. You're not killing it and you're not, um, you can't do it all at once. Um, and the women also engaged in a lot of self-motivational self-talk. So like, you can do this, you got this you're you've won before and you can win again and when things got hard um if if there weren't external sources of motivation the women themselves gave themselves that type of talk um and also self-imposed rewards so if i get this work done i can take my kids to the park um, and then we also saw a lot of prioritization where a lot of the times they just couldn't do things that they did in the past such as, um, I mean, even some big things like family reunions or attend a wedding or not, they didn't get to go out with friends anymore. So how did the women in the study, in my study, um, strategize for self-motivation and persistence? And this included a lot of self-advocacy. So when the, when the class wasn't going well, they would approach the professor directly. If they needed help um, with something, they knew, they figured out who to go to on campus to figure it out with financial aid or student, um, student affairs or whomever it was, they, they did not stop until they figured it out. So there was a lot of self-advocacy work. They didn't take no for an answer. Um, they also had great support networks. And for me, my family played a huge role. I mean, my parents probably babysat a ton. And um, so, did, so did my husband. Um, and the number one reason why the women were persistent is because they wanted to be role models for their children, is that that was their main motivating factor, is that there was someone in their life that they had to do this for, even if it wasn't themselves. So what's next in the field, right? So I did my study in 2013, and then there were just like crickets out there in the universe. Um, now it's becoming a thing again, but the, the marketing has not changed. So here's what's fascinating. I've been, I watch, and if you look at that picture on the right, um, I took that photo in the Bismarck airport because they're still marketing toward women where like, 
you know, you can work all the time and you got this. And on the left, um, Stanford has a, a new ad out with the baby thinking about a bottle, right? So um, the, the advertising really hasn't changed and the marketing toward women hasn't changed. We really still see a lot of women in online programs. So here's what's new. Um, so Meredith Archer Hatch could not be here today, but big shout out to her and the great work that they're doing at Achieving the Dream. They're actually advocating for women today on Capitol Hill. That's why she couldn't join us. Um, but Achieving the Dream has a wonderful program called Community College Succeed. And I love, I wanna share this with you because they're doing such a great job capturing the Quantita the qualitative uh, voices of women who are actually in these programs. So let's show um, Never Give Up and you will hear all the reasons why women are succeeding in her story. I've worked for 10 years in the health field and I've had kids, I've had a you know, battle with homelessness, I've had a battle with death in the family and you know, life through many balls and curveballs at me and I It's working. I've worked for 10 years in the health field and I've had kids, I've had a you know, battle with homelessness, I've had a battle with death in the family and you know, life threw many balls and curveballs at me and I still wanted to pursue my dream of finishing you know, school. Just being here and being with the Keys program and being around other like-minded people around myself that had the same goals helped me to achieve where I am right now. I have uh, four kids and um, uh, the ages are run between uh, 20 and four years old. I have all different uh, types of uh, cheerleadings going on. <laughs> you know, I, I had the mom, why are you going back to school? Why don't you just stay, you know, home or just work? Or, and then I have like my little one who's like, me and mommy are doing homework together. And it's, uh, it, it's great, it's great. The advice I would give my former self would be never to give up on the dreams that I have. Never give up on being the person of, of strength. You know, I, at one part of my life, I had a lot of loss and I just hit rock bottom and I had to remind myself, you know, am I going to stay at the bottom or am I going to look up, you know, and, and climb out of the hole that I'm in, you know. I wanted to be my own hero and I, I, I'm doing it. It's a work in progress. So I've seen that video probably five times and it still makes me want to cry. <laughs> um, because it's so awesome to hear stories of women persisting and succeeding in higher education. There's a lot going on right now um, to support women in different angles of higher education. So Achieving the Dream is really focused on community college students. Um, the Institute for Women's Policy Research is putting out a lot of research on the gender wage gap and how we can do free college for parenting students. None of this was available in 2013. Um, there's a ton of equity work going on with open educational resources, and that's one of my favorite passion projects. But if you look at the large scale study by Colbard, Watson, and Park, you find that that students who are in OER courses have improved end of course grades, and that's especially good for Pell recipients and first time students and underserved populations. So there's just a lot more people working on equity. Um, and then individual universities have women and mothering support groups. So I have to say that there's a lot more going out that I don't even know about. And then WCET hosted this awesome webinar to talk about it. And we're also um, going to be at the WCET annual meeting. So please join us there and we'd love to see you. So now I'd like to go to questions for the panelists. 
And because um, I've talked for quite a while and I know you have lots to say. Uh, so let's start with question number one. Um, you were a mom in college and starting out in your undergrad career, what kept you going back again to achieve the next level? Okay, so I know this question really well. <laughs> so, so I'm gonna jump right in. And thanks to Tanya and the whole WCET clan for um, hosting our group therapy session today. Um, <laughs> I saw in the chat that um, it takes a lot to be vulnerable, and I shared with the group prior to this meeting that it is really hard for me personally to share some of these stories, so if I have to take a pause, I just need to let everybody know that. Um, so for me, I self-identified as a failure when I first went to college. I was 17 years old, and I failed out of the University of Tennessee. Um, that was a pretty strong indicator for me that I wasn't cut out for college and um, it wasn't until later in life when I went skydiving and failed at my first skydive we can talk about that at WCET if anybody's going there I'm happy to share the story um, but then became certified as, as an accelerated freefall skydiver that I started to realize that I really could do anything and it was it was that experience and I think back to um, what you said earlier about um, the self-talk, the positive self-talk we use, I used that experience to help me push myself during times when it was really hard. So I think of that as a helpful tool. Um, but partly it was because I had this little person that was counting on me, right? So I finished my undergraduate with a two-year-old and, um, and graduated with my undergrad degree with $20,000 in debt and uh, made twenty-eight five a year teaching first grade. It was fabulous. And realized real quick that that wasn't sustainable. So um, I, I worked to get into a master's degree program that was grant funded. So I made it through the master's degree program with very little uh, out-of-pocket expense and was able to use that to help level up from a salary perspective, career perspective. But then I started to see in my daughter's eyes how I was using the skills I was learning in school to be a better parent, how she was starting to identify going to school as a priority. And so when it was time for her to go off to school, she was so proud that she was going to school like mommy had done. Um, I had taken her to class with me many times, so she understood that school was important. Um, and I guess, you know, part of it was kind of this toss up between would I be a role model for my girls as maybe a good and a bad example, right? Like, could they draw on that experience of me being a mom, having kids and working so hard to get the next degree and the next degree that maybe they would put school first and prioritize it differently in their life? I'm okay with being a non-example. Um, so, but I wouldn't have gotten through any of it really. I mean, my kids were a great motivator. The positive self-talk was definitely helpful, but I wouldn't have gotten through any of it without the mentors, the support from, I'll say fellow sufferers, finding other women like me that had children and were struggling to get through coursework or juggling caregiving. And, you know, some people go to, you know, they have play groups. We would have like play study groups. So the kids would all play together with Legos or blocks and we would get together as a group of two or three or seven women, depending on which, you know, point in my life it was in. And the kids would all play together and we would all study together. And if it wasn't for things like that, um, I don't know that I would have made it through. So there's my story. Callie, how'd you survive? Well, I, I will say um, mine's a little different. I was not a mother as an undergrad. I had a very traditional undergrad experience. Um, it was just in graduate school where um, I became a mother while I was pursuing my graduate studies. Um, and I would say one of the hardest things for me was looking at um, others who didn't have kids and how they would, their level of empathy for someone who also had all of these other things on their plate was not high. And so um, that, was a, that was a big struggle. I had to find my program that I was in was very, there were a lot of people who, who were very much in that, you know, dual income, no kids, or um, single person, no kids kind of mentality and what else they had to do with their life. So I had to turn, I had to turn outside of my program to find other people to empathize with, right? So if I hadn't had all of you ladies and others 
in our network, I, I don't know if I would have persisted. Yeah, good point. I think um, uh, looking back, I think, you know, you get to a point where you start realizing you can do it. So for me, maybe there was a turning point where I went, oh gosh, I can actually do this. And then I couldn't stop. I don't know what it was about. I, I told Callie just in the last couple of days, I said, I have the most expensive collection of art. They're diplomas. Um, but it's because I kept going back to get the next degree and the next degree. And, and so then it became a thing. Like right now, honestly, I already have the PhD. I'm like, what do I do next? Should I go get an MBA so people will take me seriously? I, I'm not sure what to do with myself. I have spare time. <laughs> If you all are interested in some of the research that's behind this, check out the self-efficacy theory and women being successful and then building on that. And what you're um, talking about right now just fits right into the literature all about women's success. Also the whole piece about mentors. Um, I wouldn't have made it without Nancy Bentley, <laughs> my dissertation director. So, you know, I mean, there's these, these women who just, if you say their name, that person, was the person who made it all happen for you. Dr. Joanne Canales. Right, who else? I'll say the name because yeah. she was with me when I finished my undergrad. So she was that teacher, the very last teacher I had in my undergrad career. And then she persisted to push me to get back into the, the master's degree. And then I would check in with her and I would ask, what about this doctoral program? What about this doctoral program? And she kept telling me, no, if you're going to go to school that long, you probably want to get the PhD. And so she, she helped kind of formulate my roadmap for myself. I wouldn't have chosen my path. Um, I, I, I thank her a lot for helping me make, uh, find the next step on my journey. I think everybody's got that person like in your head, right? That you're thinking of. So if we go to the next question, um, tell me about what it took for you to be successful and complete your coursework and persist in your studies. Um, what support systems did you create and what experiences led to the need for this type, type of support? Sure, so I can talk about that. Um, I think uh, for me, I was always a very independent person who did not like to ask for help and wanted to um, you know, do everything on my own. And um, at one point in my life, I found myself divorced and a single mother of three children. And I described that time as um, at one point, you ha you know, you're putting the pieces of a puzzle together and you know what the puzzle is supposed to look like when it's done. And then somebody knocked the puzzle over and there's no longer a picture. Um, and so it was a, a, a really difficult time and I was just really lucky to have a lot of um, people around me who supported me and um, I was teaching part-time for SUNY Empire State College at the time and a number of um, both female and male mentors really encouraged me to go back for my PhD. Um, and one person, since we're shouting out names, um, is Meg Benke. She was a huge um, mentor and supporter for me. Um, but it still took me a year before I was really able to make that decision. And a lot of that, I think, had to do with imposter syndrome and um, the, the self-efficacy. And so that was really when the support system started, was just you know, having, fa having family and friends around telling me that they would be there for me, that they would support me, that I should just you know, make the decision and go back to school, which I did. And then once I was in school, um, so I was, in addition to raising my kids, I continued to work full time at a job where I traveled internationally um, one week a month. And I was also taking a full course load. And so I very quickly realized that I could not do it alone and that um, I had to ask for help. And when people offered to help, um, I had to accept it. So I think that's just advice that I would give to people is, you know, ask for help. And if somebody offers to help you, that they're, they're, genuine, um, they're genuinely offering to help you. And in addition for me, the, the flexibility and support of my coworkers, like I said, for example, you know, Meg really helped me think about how I could balance work in my schoolwork. Um, you know, this was like several years ago, if I was traveling, uh, faculty let me, let me attend classes uh, via Zoom. 
So I think, you know, support comes from many places. It comes from family, friends, teachers. And um, I used to have something called Monday night dinner where I would have everybody over to my house every Monday night and when I, and I would make dinner. And when I went back to school, um, all of my friends actually took that over. And so when I would get home from class at like 8 or 9 p.m. at night, I would come home and my home would be full of family and friends who were taking care of my children and feeding them and helping them with the, their homework. Um, so um, that, was, that was critical for me. And in my dissertation, those stories came up over and over about the importance of you know, having that support system and having family and friends there for you. Um, and I, when I, when I um, was thinking about doing, you know, getting ready for this, I, you know, went back to some reflections that I had actually done during my dissertation, and I reread the acknowledgement that I wrote in my dissertation. And so I did just want to share it because I think that as I read that, I was like, this just really summarizes what a support system is. So if you'll bear with me, um, I said, this was not a journey traveled alone without the immense encouragement and support of my children, Nicholas, Angelica, and Rosalina. I would not be sitting here writing this today. They were and continue to be my inspiration. And on the days when it all seemed too much, it drove me not to give up. Those who told me to just breathe and help to lighten my load when I needed it most and helped me stay on the path when I felt lost. Um, and so it was also my children. They were just and continue to be a huge support, um, as I know um, some of us have mentioned. Um, and Leah, what did you find um, you needed support systems or how did you incorporate support? Well, I am currently in an online uh, program right now for my doctoral degree, and, and what I really found was, was truly leaning on my, my peers that are in my cohort. And initially, it was really difficult to do so because pride got in the way. I didn't want others to know that I was second-guessing um, mm -hmm. my, my ability um, and that I was maybe having difficulty um, understanding an assignment or maybe maybe making a connection with, with the, the course instructor. And so um, I truly generated um, a, a really wonderful group of, of individuals who have supported, supported you know, each and every one of us throughout, throughout this time. And, and, and of course, P Patrice, you know, leaning on my family is that other piece um, and, and, and reaching out and saying, hey, I'm, I'm tired. And I really need some time, quality time with family. Let's really do something and actually uh, take that time and not feel guilty that I wasn't or am not focusing on, on my studies at that time. So it's really giving yourself permission to actually have a life while you are, are pursuing that, that online academia. Yeah, I think that's a great point, and um, I'm glad you brought that up because I think self-care is something especially women tend not to prioritize or think about, um, and that is really important. And for me, and it took me, I was well into my PhD when um, I started to kind of wrestle with this, is um, many of us are perfectionists. And um, there came a point many times where I had to decide, you know, am I going to go to my son's lacrosse game or am I going to, you know, edit this paper one more time because maybe I'll get an A instead of an A minus. And I, you know, I realized that, you know, if I were to look back in 10 or 20 years, it's spending time with family would be the memory that I would want, not that, you know, I fixed one more typo. So I think that's something else is just re readjusting your priorities. And again, um, having people to reach out to that kind of can support you in making those really difficult decisions. So this is a good one for the women who were um, parenting while in college. And how do you maintain your studies and still involved with your kids' lives, which we just kind of um, touched on a little bit. But that photo of Ruby staring at me as like a 10-month-old is like guilt to hear. And I know we've all experienced it. So tell me how you maintain your studies and also in, be involved with your kids. So I'll start with that one. Um, I think 
honestly, I think one of the biggest things is learning to let go and reflecting upon what you remember about the time where your children are um, as your own self as a child, right? So my mom also was a student while I was a kid. And so for me, reflecting on that, I, I loved it, right? But my kids were younger than I was when she was a student. But I also have to remember, like, I don't remember my second birthday party. If it wasn't perfect, it wasn't perfect. So um, like Patrice talked about, having to let go of some of that, that perfectionism and also um, knowing that by calling upon others in our lives to support our kids when we have to be away for class or um, for work, so be that our partners or our friends or their aunts or grandparents, um, whoever that is, that gives them another person in their life who they have a good bond with. So that helps me, and maybe it's just my rationalizing, but that helps me that they're building a better relationship with the other parent as well, or with their aunt, or with uh, an aunt-like figure, right, along the way. So, um, and you're right, as Patrice talked about, sometimes you just have to, like, let it go, right? Sometimes the laundry is going to be stacked up in the in the room. Um, as I tell my daughters now, you have to embrace your inner, inner Elsa and just let it go. Because in the long run, what matters is the relationship and getting to your goals and laundry and, you know, and those types of things um, can be let go. So would anyone else want to step in and, and share well, how mom, they deal with My mom was a student too when I was in uh, kindergarten, second grade, whatever. And she would say if I wanted to hang out with her, I had to quiz her on her homework. Um, so, I, you know, there might be some way that I was able to integrate my kids into my coursework. So I remember Dakota sitting next to me with his like baby books, his little kid books and saying, mommy, I can, I can learn important things too. And then I would give him like a little mini assignment and say, okay, read your dinosaur book and then draw me pictures about dinosaurs and we'll do homework together. And in some way he felt more part of it or like he was, and at least we're sitting next to each other. I don't know, but um, I didn't make them completely stay out of my space. I did wear noise canceling headphones though, but they didn't have to be out of the room. <laughs> yeah. So my mommy guilt, I still deal with cause I have a sophomore in high school still at home and, um, and my kids as, and I didn't even notice what I was doing, but my kids pointed out to me, it's probably been 10 years ago now, mom, how come when you're going to fly on Monday to go to a conference or work or whatever, you're, you do, you stay up really late to do all the laundry. You go to the grocery store, you make sure our lunches are packed. Like there was, there were all these things I was doing in preparation for being gone that I didn't even notice that my kids were picking up on that I was doing so that everything would be okay while I was gone. My husband could easily have made lunches or done the laundry <clears throat> in case he's watching this later. He would have done a great job. Um, but I felt like I needed to do all these things in preparation as if it were my job on top of a full-time job and going to school. And so it was like, I was in charge of all of the household responsibilities ish. Um, all of my schoolwork and my career, which I've been working this whole time. So it, it, I get your point when you said it was like the third shift or fourth or fifth or, you know, part-time job number seven, whatever it was, it just seemed like it, I was doing too much. And um, my older daughter, who's now 20 and lives on her own in New York City, yay her, um, has actually told me, she said, I, I don't know how you did it. I don't know how you do it. I want to grow up to be like you. Coffee. <laughs> don't grow up to be like me. Be better than me, please. So Yeah, and I, you know, I think for me, when I was making that decision to go back, one of the things that was holding me back was I was really afraid it was going to destroy my children, that I would be so busy with school and work that they would be neglected. Um, and I think really it was the opposite, that it really made them more 
resilient. And to your point, Whitney, like, you know, when they saw the strength it took to do what I did, it made them stronger. It has, you know, inspired them. And my older daughter is now getting her master's. So hopefully my um, pursuit of education has, uh, tr has the trickle down effect. <laughs> So this is Megan, I'm gonna jump in because I'm the master timekeeper. We're gonna to go to the fourth and final question and then there's some really good questions in the audience Q&A and in the chat box that I'd love to get to and we're running up on 15 minutes. So let's get to this last question, which is what tips and strategies do you use to help women in online programs succeed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is Leah and I'll go ahead and address that question. And, and, and really from, from my standpoint, the very first tip or strategy is you need to really sit down with your online faculty, uh, your adjuncts, and, and tell them who your, who your students are. And then tie that to your, the institution's mission. So for example, United Tribes, we are, we're built on the foundation of empowering leaders. And, and because of that, we need to understand, as, as several of the panelists have stated, is that many of our, our women um, go back to college to earn a degree or another degree because it is for their children. And, and if we, as, as higher education institutions, understand why our students go to school, um, we can really formulate strategies to assist them. Um, we, we do a full wraparound for our, our students within um, our online and campus um, courses. So if you would envision a, a group of individuals from student support across campus holding hands and that student is in the center and that student is attempting to actually leave their academic program that, that we hold our hands so tight and we actually embrace them and catch them and say, we're not going to let you go that easy. We have this opportunity here for you or this resource to help you along. And therefore, it doesn't become an exit strategy for that student. It becomes one of embracing and empowering them and, and really saying, hey, you're a parent. You're a caretaker of some young children. We recognize this. Let's work together so that you can be successful. Um, and I know that time is limited here, so if any other panelists do want to maybe share some tips and strategies, please do so. I love hearing you talk, Leah, and I learned a lot of that from you when I was working with you, so um, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll just jump in because I think there are probably a whole suite of strategies that Tanya shared a little bit earlier on, but Leah, I heard you say earlier something about pride and I'm seeing in the chat that it's hard to accept help. Sometimes Patrice talked about that. I have felt that way myself and I think pride sometimes gets in the way that I can do it or I should do it or we put too many demands on ourselves, and so that can be a challenge. And I had, I had my mentor, who I gave a shout out to earlier, tell me she was very excited about a new initiative that they were rolling out at my former institution, where they were going to have a food bank for students. And I think that's great. And I love the work of Sarah goldrick Rob and others who are looking to solve the challenge of hunger on campuses. But pride would have gotten in the way for me. I was, I was on all kinds of different assistance to support my children, the WIC and and um, food stamps and the like, but I probably wouldn't have gone to a food bank on campus and looked my classmates in the eyes who work the food bank, right, because it's student-led, um, in order to go take care of what my needs were. I, so I, I think there, we have to be good and open at listening to students and asking the question, how can I help you? And then wait for it. Because I think we can design some solutions that will work, but they won't work for everyone, and we have to be really great empathetic listeners because each individual has such unique needs. Leah, did you, do you have a way of communicating when a student, you feel like a student is in trouble with the other faculty? You said you, you know, work with all the faculty or teach them. Um, if you know that a student is having trouble, how do you communicate that and, and kind of engage the circle, right? 
Sure. So we, we do have a robust early alert system. So when we do we do see a, a student who is is at risk of, of, of not persisting or, or being retained, um, it is full hands on deck. And so we do mimic the same services uh, for our online students that we do for our campus based students. So we have instructors that reach out, their academic advisors, and then even the personal counselors. And uh, ultimately what we do is we try not to take too much time, um, you know, let time elapse. We really pick up the phone or email that student right away and let them know that we care about their success. And we go back to how can we help you be successful? And I would just mention the, uh, the importance of mentors. I think in my research, I found the biggest gap was um, having guidance um, from an advisor or mentor. And the stories of success I heard were women that had a mentor who really took the time to listen to their story. They felt like they had a relationship of trust with them and it was somebody that they could go to when they had a problem or they needed support. And so from an administrative perspective, I know a lot of times um, people are overloaded, but thinking about you know, how we can provide that level of support for women, because I think that's really important. And I would, I would add that that doesn't have to be a formal person, a formal program or a formal, um, or actually your, your advisor, your chair, your mentor, whoever that is at the university. Um, I had the unfortunate experience of losing the woman who was championing me coming back to school and, um, and, you know, pursuing my graduate studies. And uh, I didn't find the support at the university anymore that I had had when she was there. I found the support in these people and, you know, these ladies who are here with me today and the other, the other people I have um, in my online network. So, uh, but encouraging people that if you're facing that, that it's not all, that it's not all lost, right? You may have lost that one person, but that doesn't mean you lost yourself. So continuing to persist beyond that is important. And then in the chat, I want to pop over there. Um, there's been a conversation going on about strategies for students who never come to campus. Um, I was at a very traditional land-based um, institution when I was doing my studies, um, but I was doing some of them online. They allowed me to do that. Uh, I don't know, it's a special thing. I traveled so much, um, but there was never anything online for me. And when I came to work for um, APUS, we have like 200 student orgs online. We are 100% online university. So, and we don't have to offer them a lot of, you know, resources in order to do that. We help them find places to meet online and provide them the networks to connect to each other. But they do, they do all, you know, they do all of the work, if you will, of having their meetings and building that, that community. So, I think it's important as we move into kind of this post-traditional world, if you will, where more students are distributed, where they're going to work in a distributed environment, but it's important that we help them learn those skills. Yeah, having office hours on Zoom, right? Having ways for students to find you when they need you and to find each other when they need support networks of, of peers. Thank you, Callie. I'm going to jump in and get to some of these questions. Uh, the one that you just addressed was one of the questions I was really hoping we could target because I wanted, I want our attendees to walk away with specific strategies for retaining women in online. And I think one of those big takeaways was certainly that we need the support. We need the opportunity for people to say, this is really hard, but you're going to get through it. So an anonymous attendee asked the great question, what specific course design elements might influence retention of women in online courses? And I'm gonna have Patrice answer that and then we'll move on to another question. So Patrice, what specific course design elements might influence retention of women in online courses? Uh, so this is going to sound maybe simple, but um, course, good course navigation and structure and um, being able to find what you need easily. Um, you know, as we talked about, women are probably more strapped for time than anyone, and they're balancing a lot. And if they have to spend a lot of time 
trying to figure out where that reading is that they need or like when they're supposed to post to the discussion, um, they're going to get frustrated or, you know, it's going to take time away from them doing the work that we actually want them to do. So in the research that I've found that came up over and over again, and also teacher presence, just, you know, um, the, the faculty member being present in the course and interacting with the students so again, so that they knew that that person was there to support them and they were more apt in those cases to reach out and ask for help when they needed help versus you know, if the instructor just kind of disappeared. I've been having some really good luck using Slack for communication with courses and I know that it feels like maybe I'm on all the time, but um, if a student all of a sudden has a panic and can't um, submit something into the course, I know immediately and I can help right away. Um, so there are other ways of communication that just are more instantaneous, but I also like the Zoom idea or um, once weekly meetings that are optional or something like that that are face-to-face -face online. Great, and I wanna ask Leah, we are understanding that these online communities and support communities and mentoring are so important. How do we help facilitate the connections to uh, like-minded people that might be for uh, underserved populations? You know, I, just, I, I think the biggest piece is, is really understanding where they're coming from first and, and generally listening uh, to them with, without any assum assumptions or, or judgment. I think that's, that's the biggest uh, starting ground or the foundation of, of uh, these discussions uh, ultimately is, uh, you know, I think about Nell nodding that culture of care, but also Dr. Uh, uh, Gaten uh, Swisher also talked about competence is you still have to hold a high level of expectation for success ultimately is what guidance and support can you get them there. And then the other piece is individuality. We cannot treat every student the same. Mm -hmm. They are they're unique individuals, so we really need to talk about differentiating um, how we communicate and, and the work we do to help them be successful. Terrific. And one last question. Uh, we barely have time, but I want to squeeze it in really quickly. So if whoever decides to answer it could answer fairly quickly. It is an important question. Uh, Terry Strout, who is a former WCET um, researcher, says, I also had an amazing set of female mentors. Do you think that our daughters will need mentors as much as we did, or do you think that there will be more balance and family responsibility by then? I'll jump right in on that one, Megan. Uh, you can't be a prophet in your own land. We know it in work. We know it in our lives, right? Uh, I, ha I can say the same thing to my daughter a hundred times, but if she hears it from somebody else, she magically hears it. So yes, <laughs> everybody needs mentors, even our own children. Well said. On that note, I'd like to just pass it back over to Tanya briefly for any wrap up and then I'll run us through the last housekeeping slides. But Wonderful discussion. I do look forward to continuing this discussion at the annual meeting coming up in November. All I want to say is thank you. And this is not over. So we've got a lot more to do in this field and um, can't wait to hear all the great things that happen next. Great. And if this is your first WCET webcast, we do several webcasts a month. We have one coming up at the end of the month, which is a, uh, all you need to know about working with an OPM with Phil Hill. And we have lots of resources on our website, so check it out. Our annual meeting is coming up November 5th to 7th here in Denver. And the link to the recording as well as the slides will be sent out to you as soon as possible, hopefully by tomorrow. And then you can always visit our website and view the archives. Thank you to our supporting members and our sponsors that underwrite much of the good work that we do here at WCET. And thank you for being engaged and attentive and interested. Really appreciate the conversation today. So thank you for participating. We'll see you on the next webcast. Thanks all, have a wonderful day. Right. Thank you.